All right. Well, uh, a, a good portion of contemporary analytic philosophy of religion is concerned with this particular creature, the absolutely perfect being. In fact, this would not be a creature or a created thing. This would be the creator, the source of all other things. This is a, a, a good, uh, tight definition of what today most people call God. So uh, we've kind of been doing perfect being theology all along, certainly in the early portion of the course when we were looking at arguments for God's existence. Notice that what we were getting in each case, um, uh, ontological argument uh, being the exception, was uh, not God so generally put, but we were getting in our conclusion um, a being described by some more particular attributes. So in the design argument, the conclusion was there's likely some kind of you know, designer, some creative, powerful, intelligent, though not absolutely powerful or absolutely intelligent. The designer argument does not get you to the conclusion that there is a perfectly powerful, perfectly intelligent being. It just gets you to the conclusion that there's likely a being powerful enough to have made the universe, that's, you might think, well, that's close enough to all powerful, but um, the thing being aimed at in all of these theistic arguments is the absolutely perfect being. And uh, we can talk about the particular attributes of this being. And this prefix omni, which means all or total, is usually slapped on. I mean, you can slap it in front of almost any attribute, and that, that attribute becomes some kind of perfection or absolutism. So omnipotent, of course, means all powerful. Omnibenevolent means all good. Um, benevolent, if you break that down, um, actually means willing the good. The volence is the willing and the bene is the good. So a benevolent being is one who wills the good. An omni-benevolent being would be one who wills only the good or wills always and only the highest good. And uh, then we have eternal in that list. And we can go down. I mean, you get to, as you go down the list, you get into more debatable attributes. I mean, I think all who believe in God would agree that God is, by definition, omnipotent. But we'll be talking this unit about uh, some problems with these uh, standard agreed-upon attributes for God's existence or God's coherence. And then we'll be talking about some of the more debatable attributes, which, you know, uh, pious believers could have disagreement on, disagreement on whether God needs to have that attribute at all to be perfect. Um, so this is, it's, you know, partly just a question of how to define the term God, but we'll see there are real, uh, you know, powerful logical implications of just these these concepts for the possibility of God's existence. That is, um, it might be that built into the very definition of God and, and, and built into some of these key uncontroversial attributes like omnipotence. Um, real problems arise for the possibility of God's existence so that you can you can generate atheistic arguments just from thinking carefully about what omnipotence means. It might be that you, if you think carefully about what omnipotence means, what it implies, you can conclude with, with the high degree of logical certainty that no such being, no omnipotent being could ever exist. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that works. It, it wouldn't be that different from what Anselm was doing um, to support theism. Anselm said, Really, I mean, the ontological argument is just if you think carefully about the definition of God, that is, God is a um, 
unsurpassable being or the greatest possible being, an absolutely perfect being. I think Anselm would have been happy to call God. If you, if you just think carefully about that definition, Anselm said, you will see with the clarity in the clarity of your mind that that being must exist. Must exist. So <laughs> we're not just uh, trying to clean up our dictionary entry on God by contemplating the attributes of God or the definition of God. It has, you know, um, maybe implications for the very question of whether this being exists. So um, you might notice that in the top left trio, omnipotent, omnibenevolent, eternal, I didn't put a, a fourth item, which usually comes up pretty quickly if you ask someone to rhyme off the attributes of God. Usually they give you, actually they give you, even before eternal, they give you the three omnis, if they're at all familiar with kind of medieval or analytic philosophy, they'll say omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omni, some of you might uh, might be shouting it out, omniscient, 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 all-knowing God knows everything. Now, there's a reason I kept it off the list, and it's not because I don't think God would know a lot or even everything, but I suggest that if you think carefully about what omnipotence entails, it includes omniscience. So you don't need to list omniscience separately, though it's often useful as a reminder um, that omniscience reduces into omnipotence, or it's a one of the sub-attributes of omnipotence. An omnipotent being can do anything, and knowing is a kind of doing. <laughs> it's an ing word. And so if you can do anything, then you can give me the answer to any question I propose to you, right? You can pass any test on any subject. Uh, so omnipotence is it's pretty powerful. It, it, it takes in a lot. And in fact, it might be that you can continue this kind of reduction. Part of the, I think, part of the game and the challenge of doing this sort of APB theology at the level of definition is to see how much you can simplify the definition of God. I mean, you know, we don't want a long grocery list when we're talking about God. I mean, you know, in, in prayer and liturgy and chant and whatnot, it, it's nice to have 99 names or 108 names or 1,025 names of the divine so you can rhyme and you can... get specific in your praise, but when we do philosophy, it might be we want to just think very carefully about the meaning of each of these attributes. And, and when we do so, we might realize that actually we only need three, <laughs> that maybe these top three, if you think about them, and I, I, I'm not proposing that these three in particular would generate all of these, but... Uh, I do think start if you start with omnipotence, you might be able to get to quite a few of these. I mean, take omnipresence. Right? An omnipresent being is a being who, who is everywhere, who is never absent, or at least has the capacity to be present at any given place and time at will. Well, if you're omnipotent, you can do anything, including manifest yourself at any place and time or manifest yourself at all places and all times perpetually. So omnipotence would seem to at least include the capability of omnipresence, right? And then an omnipotent being could choose to manifest that omnipresence or not. But um, this, uh, this omnipotence thing is... Uh, Again, unsurprisingly, a pretty powerful attribute. I, I do think omnibenevolence is, seems, you know, it, well, it seems distinct from power. You can imagine a being who can do anything but chooses to do the evil. 
So um, I'm, and, and on the other hand, you can imagine an omnibenevolent being who uh, just lacks the power and the know-how to manifest good in the world. So you might have totally good intentions. You might be omnibenevolent in that sense. You, you, you will only the good, but your will is so weak, it has very, very little effect on the world around you. So we want God to have uh, a good will, to be omnibenevolent, and then we want God to be able to manifest that will through potence. Impassibility is, is a term that uh, really doesn't come up a lot in you know, theology discussion outside of people doing this perfect being theology, I think. And we'll talk a little bit about it in a moment. What I've been getting at with this idea of reducing God's attributes to a small set is the idea of simplicity. Some are, are some who think about God really like the idea that God would be a simple being, not simple as in simpleton, um, and not simple as in people sometimes say in India, they say he's a very simple man, and they mean that as praise. They mean he has very few needs and um, you know, doesn't need jam on his toast. Um, God would be simple in the sense of having maybe just a single attribute from which all the other attributes are manifest or of which the other attributes are mere facets. So it might be that God in itself, I'm going to say it, not to be disrespectful, but to, well, maybe, you know, to avoid genderizing God, this, you know, I think Yahweh is pretty male. Yahweh is clearly a dude. I even think Allah has got some pretty masculine qualities, though maybe he's a little more abstracted often, but um, Yahweh's got some blood and personality and is pretty male. But when, when you get to this absolutely perfect being in, in, the, in the Christian, in the history of that tradition, and it really emerges, I think, in the medieval period, around the time of people like Aquinas and Anselm, uh, this being is, is getting pretty neutered, um, degendered, uh, partly from philosophic pressure, you know, understanding that this being, to be perfect, can't be super specific like we are. You know, our maleness or our femaleness is, is, is among other things, a limitation. If you're male, then you're not female. <laughs> if you're this, then you're not that. And, and if, uh, as we move up the great chain of being to greater and greater uh, strata of perfection, you know, as you get to the angels, you're getting to these beings who seem a little bit neutered or... Uh, post-sexual or beyond sexual gender. Okay, let's continue. So uh, here just, just to get our feet wet, uh, we can talk about omnipresence and see what some of these classic medievals have said about it. According to Anselm, we met him with his famous ontological argument not long ago, God is present in each place, but not contained in it. You can see why Anselm would make this distinction. Anselm wants God to be everywhere, but on the other hand, does not want God to be constrained by this location, because uh, constraint is limitation. So Anselm says God would be present, but not contained. Uh, we tend to be contained by our place. When we're in a room, the room contains us, and we're bound in by its walls, and we have to cut a hole in the wall and put a door on to get in and out. Um, God can be in the room without being contained by it, according to Anselm. Uh, Aquinas, uh, you can see here in this definition that Aquinas gives us, God's presence is really being reduced to these other um, attributes. And I wouldn't even worry about the third attribute, essence, too much. I can't, I can't actually make too much sense of what Aquinas is saying there. And it seems to me that you can just reduce God's presence to God's power and knowledge. And this is, Aquinas is just pointing out to us that you don't need to separately list God's omnipresence. That if, if, you, if you say God is perfectly powerful and knowledgeable, then you're, you're already claiming God would be, in a sense, everywhere also. And as we've seen, 
if you can reduce knowledge to power, then really God's omnipresence is just, it's another attribute that just reduces to omnipotence. If you're omnipotent, then you're also thereby omnipresent. So here's, here's a quote from Aquinas. This is, and I certainly have not read it, uh, cover to cover. I've come across little chunks of it over the years. This is the Summa Theologiae, Theologiae um, his great work of theology, um, which he wrote in a monastery sometime in the, mm, in the 1300s, in the early days of university life. Uh, God is in all things by his power, inasmuch as all things are subject to his power. He is in all things by his presence in all things, inasmuch as all things are bare and open to his eyes. And stop there. Don't worry about the essence part. So you see what Aquinas is saying here. He's saying uh, God's presence is just through his power and knowledge. He's present in this room because he knows absolutely what's going on in this room. Now, if you're, if you're um, accessing a classroom remotely, let's say you have a video feed into a classroom at Ryerson and, um, you know, a classroom in uh, Kerr Hall, and there's a video camera set up in one corner of the room pointing towards the front of the room and videotaping the lecturer maybe, and you're sitting at home in front of your laptop and you're watching a video feed of the lecture, through your knowledge, you have knowledge, like real-time updated knowledge, visual knowledge and audio knowledge of what's going on in that room at Kerr Hall, right? And that knowledge is a kind of presence. You're, you're kind of there, kind of, in the room by knowing what's going on. Especially if we add in power, if we, if we give you the access to pipe in with questions into the room, we give you an audio feed into the room through loudspeaker set up in the room. Then through your power now and your knowledge, you're, you, you, it's like you're starting to manifest now in that room. You're aware of what's going on in it, and now you can speak up and your voice is manifest in that room. You're Through your power and your knowledge, you've got some presence in that room now. And that's just with one little camera pointing at the room. And, um, you know, maybe in high definition streaming back to you, but you've got to remember God is all knowing. So it's like God has an infinite number of nano cameras of 360 degree, <laughs> um, nano cameras suffusing the room so that God knows not just what the lecturer is saying and whether he or she's scratching their nose or not, but God sort of knows what's going on in every subatomic particle of that room from every angle. I mean, that's that's omniscience for you, knowing everything. And um, if you re so, if you just think about what that kind of total knowledge means, it's it, you got to ask, well, how's that different from just being present? I mean, what do you mean by present? in the room. Surely it has something to do, at least in part, with just awareness of the room. And then combine that with God's power. And if God could at any moment make any atom in the room disappear or manifest a new atom in the room or cause the speaker to scratch their nose, or if God just has total control over that room too, then God's power is sort of manifest in that room and that room is you almost want to say that room is contained by god enclosed by god's power subject to god's power and total awareness so god's omnipresence is quite a it's like an overbearing presence some people when they're present in a room they kind of take it over a little bit and god's presence could be like that and remember you might just i mean here we've along with aquinas reduced this, this this commonly listed trait of God, his its uh, omnipresence. We've we've reduced that to power and knowledge, and not worrying about his essence. And then we can reduce, I think, the the knowledge to the power. The knowledge to the power.
quick question to think about, maybe a little homework assignment. Um, can you reduce the other way? Can you reduce power into knowledge? In other words, if you knew everything, would you buy that fact that you know everything be able to do anything too? I think it's debatable. I think, I think some of you will um, come to one conclusion. Some of you will come to the other. But just to give you a couple thoughts, one for one side, one for the other, thoughts which you may be thinking right now. If you know how to do anything, then you can do it, no? If you know everything, then you know how to do anything. <laughs> and then you can do it. What's the difference between really, really knowing how to do something and doing it or being able to do it right so so that would that would that's a that's a thought in favor of the view that omniscience omniscience includes omnipotence that if you're omniscient then you're thereby omnipotent too a thought for the other side for for the view that no omniscience would not on its own include omnipotence a thought for that would be well you might know how to do it, but you just may lack the power to do it. You may lack the energy. Uh, intelligence could be inert in that sense. It could just, it could know everything, but it needs something else, something a little bit magical called the will or the volence or the potence to take effect. I mean, this is the nerds problem, right? The nerd knows everything, but the jocks rule the school because the jocks have will and power <laughs> and the nerds know. But then again, of course, the nerds win. The nerds get their revenge by taking over the world through AI, which they design. Their, their knowledge leads to a very high level of power. Um, and the jocks ultimately are washing the nerds car like in the end of Back to the Future. I don't know. Something to think about. Charles Hartshorn. God's relation to world is like mind to body. Your, what's the relation between your mind and your body? It's weird. You got these two things, it seems, um, and they're in intimate contact. Your mind seems to be, so sometimes it seems like it's situated inside your body. It's this ghost in the machine, or it's the theater in your skull. And it also seems to have power. It's like the rider of the chariot. The body is the chariot and your mind is the rider. And your mind says, my dad used to, some, uh, you'd hear him in the morning and say, okay, old man, get up. And then he'd get up. And then he'd say, I told him to get up and he got up. <laughs> the mind charioteers uh, the body. It tells the body what to do. And then the body hopefully responds. Uh, you might think, well, God, God is to world like our mind is to our body, that God's got presence in the world in the same way that our mind has suffused our body with will and intelligence. It, it commandeers it in that way. Uh, you know what? Just uh, um, you know, these, these CPR chapters, if you look in the table of contents of your CPR textbook, you'll see pretty much a chapter, five or 10 page chapter for almost every attribute you could imagine for God, including the, the three big omnis and I think a couple for eternity and, and on and on and on. And there's, you know, in the discussion of omnipresence, you get a surveying of various views and, and Hartshorns comes up there. But uh, we're not going to consider every view, just like when we covered the ontological argument, we didn't, we didn't go through the whole history of it. We really focused on Anselm and then we focused on Guanilo's classic objection. Um, we did not try to do a full survey of even the, the major objections. We'll be selective as we go through. But let's, let's talk about this pair of attributes. They're, they're paired because they're quite similar. In fact, you might think about reducing one to the other. 
immutability and impassibility. The impassable word is a little bit weird, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about its meaning in a moment. Immutable, uh, you might already know that word. And you look at the mute, the mute, the mute in the heart of immutable is the same mute you find in mutation. And the suggestion is change. So a, a mutable being is a changeable being, and immutable being is an unchangeable being. And then we can ask, well, would God be immutable or mutable? Which would be better, mutability or immutability? Which is a perfection? And so that's the debate. And I think this is one of those attributes which you'll get um, good faith theists divided on. If, if you force them to think about it, a lot of them probably haven't even thought about it much, but um, if you ask them on a train ride and are making conversation, you might get uh, five saying, yes, immutable, and five saying uh, no to immutable. Mutable means unchangeable. Impassable means unaffectable, uh, closely related. And you, again, you might reduce the latter to the former, but an impassable being is one who can't, can't be affected, is beyond um, being affected by things going on. Uh, so is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> should should God uh, be unaffected by things going on in the world, or should God be very much affected by things going on in the world? What's better, to be unmoved um, by the events of the world, or to be very moved by them? Notice, to be moved by them is to be subject to them, and it might be a threat to your omnipotence. If the world moves you, that means the world has effects on you. And that means um, your power is subject to the world. And you're no longer the first cause, it seems. So if you want be God to be the first cause, the, the unmoved mover, as Aristotle famously called, called it, then um, you, you got you to gotta favor immutability or Im impassibility and immutability. So here's, here are a couple of reasons to think. Uh, oh, we'll look at reasons. Yay and nay for, for these attributes. So uh, immutable, God's perfection. We just um, uh, got at the same idea through impassibility. If you want God to be perfect, uh, then God should be unchangeable. Why? Well, if God's perfect, there's nowhere to go. You're at the summit. If you change, um, there's, only, there's only, you can only go, you can only get worse if you're already perfect, if you're at the very apex of existence. So by God's perfection, you might conclude God's immutability. On the other hand, so here's a here's a response to that. Couldn't there be many varieties of perfection? I mean, think of uh, think of uh, I don't know, like an improvised musical performance. You're watching a great jazz saxophonist, and uh, they go do 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 da, do 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 da. And you say, oh, I love that dumb. I love that note. I love that dumb. Um, well, yeah, it felt pretty perfect. Not, not in my rendition, but that felt great. Was that the only note John Coltrane could have played there? Well, probably not. Probably Coltrane is such a great musician. There are at any given moment in his performance many choices available to him. There are many different notes he could play and make work many different things he can do. And, and in a given performance, he does this and not that. And that's that performance. That's that specific performance. But he could have done something else. He could have made a different dance move. And it would have been just as good, maybe, if he was on that night. So uh, perfection might not be one thing. There might not just be one version of it. There might be varieties of perfection. And you might want your God actually to be meta-perfect, that is, able to modulate at will between the varieties of perfection like a great dancer and the dancer i mean that's that's w one of the great metaphors of of god you know the dancing uh, shiva the nataraj in in hinduism god uh, is this uh, dynamic force who's always changing and the ch we 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 read the changes of this perfect being in the world the world and its changes are just the modulations of God's own perfection um, expressed through space and time. So, so what have we done here? 
Reason to think God's unchangeable. Well, God's perfect. And so God could only get worse, is the idea. And then I've just countered that argument with the thought that maybe God moves from one kind of perfection to another without becoming less perfect. So it's a debate. We're, we're, I'm talking to myself. A lot of philosophy is you talking to yourself. A philosophy is the, is the ability to talk to yourself in voices to play two characters, the yay and the nay, or the pro and the con. It's this dialectical ability. God's simplicity, here's another reason to think God's immutable. If God is simple, in the sense we talked about, then there's no, no way to change, and no need to change, I guess. Um, simple here means having no parts. So uh, a complex thing has parts. complex thing is composed of parts a simple thing has no parts and and notice how weird simplicity is in the atomic age we now think that um, um, well it gets weird down at the subatomic level I guess but almost anything you could point to has parts, even if it seems simple, right? That grain of salt you point to seems like a simplicity, but look at it under the right microscope and you see it's composed of many, many, many parts. And look at one of those parts and you'll see it's composed of subparts. And, um, you know, maybe at some point you get down to the electron or something which doesn't itself seem to be composed of parts. Um, but um, that's out of my domain of familiarity. Uh, God's simplicity, God's simplicity. So by if, if, if God is simple, having no parts, then there'd be nothing to change. Change here implies the uh, when a thing changes, some of it changes and some of it stays the same. Right? If all of it changed, if all of its parts changed, then it would, it would, it would, you, you'd, you'd rather say, oh, that thing has become a different thing. If suddenly the person sitting beside you turned into a vase of flowers, you wouldn't say, oh, Jimmy has just, um, well, you might say Jimmy's become a vase of flowers. <laughs> I think the, the more horrifying thought would be Jimmy has been replaced by a vase of flowers. That Jimmy is no longer, and in Jimmy's place is a vase of flowers. Even if there is a one-to-one -one correlation with every atom in Jimmy's body, every each atom of Jimmy's body was transformed or rearranged into a vase or flower atom, even if there was that one-to-one -one correspondence, you, you'd be prone to say, Jimmy is no longer, and a uh, vase of flowers now is. When, a th when we say, oh, look, Jimmy got a new haircut, we say Jimmy got a new haircut, meaning Jimmy's still here, but his hair has changed. So a part of Jimmy has changed, and uh, many other parts have, have stayed continuous. When we attribute change to a thing, we usually mean Part of it has changed and part of it has stayed the same. That's the part that changes is the change. And the part that stays the same is what lets you say he has changed, but he is still he. Okay. God is simple. And there, again, there, why would you think God is simple? Well, this is debatable, but um, uh, I mean, you can read the chapter on simplicity and CPR if you're curious. But uh, we talked a bit about how it, it might just be that when you think carefully about God's attributes, they really do boil down to a single attribute like omnipotence. And in that case, God might be just a simple kind of power or energy. And uh, when we encounter that power, we, we it, it it hits us um, from one f reflection of one facet or another. So when we approach that power, that holy, it we interpret it, we specify it, we perceive it, we filter it into these specific attributes of intelligence and and power and goodness and eternity but the thing is just one thing that's a magnificent idea um, it's in a way the the summation of the monotheistic tendency right i mean monotheism is the tendency good or bad it's the tendency to reduce the divine into a single thing and we we, we think of the first move of that being going from a pantheon like the ancient greek pantheon of many gods with subspecialties 
um, to a, a, a henotheism where one god gains a kind of ascendance or dominance over the others. So most actually polytheistic systems are henotheistic, where there's a dominant god like a Zeus or an Indra. And, um, and then that's boiled all into one. Then, you know, the monotheists come along, the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians, and they um, accuse the other uh, neighboring cults of idolatry, of idolatrizing God into these specific entities. And then you can go further with that monotheism and say God is not just a single dude who's got all these great qualities like a super dad. All those qualities themselves boil into a single quality. So, mon you know, the idea that God is simple is just the ultimate expression of that mono monotheistic tendency. And if you've got, coming into this question about immutability and impassibility, if you've got good reason to already favor the view that God's simple, then you might say, well, God's simple, so God can't change. There are some reasons, on the other hand, on that train conversation with the theist to take the opposing view that God would be mutable, God would be changeable, should be changeable. God's agency, God does stuff. And to do something, you've got to go from a state of not doing to doing. Change is good. Change, change can sometimes seem like something you are subject to. <laughs> or it might seem to imply that you're seeking stasis, you're seeking perfection, and you're not quite there yet. But change could also just imply power. I'm mutable, and that's part of my power. I can go from one thing to another. I mean, a lot of our superheroes, their superpowers are kind of mutability. They can shape shift, or they can go from one state to another very easily. We think of that as being superhuman. God's agency, agency here just means um, activity, willed activity. And God's omniscience, um, God knows what's going on in the world. God, uh, God's knowledge is changing with the world. To be not knowledgeable is to be re responsive to what's going on. And um, so right now, you are listening to a lecture in philosophy of religion. Right now, you are listening to some philosophy. And so God right now should know that you are listening to philosophy. And then in an hour when you're not, God should know that, well, now you're not listening to philosophy. So God's knowledge will change with the changing circumstances of the world. That's just, just part of omniscience. So here, what would be changing in, in point two? What would be changing is God's state of mind, right? The, uh, the knowledgeable mind is like a mirror of reality, and it mirrors through these true propositions what is going on, and that the, the face of the mirror, its contents will change as the world changes. And uh, now impassibility. So here um, are two reasons to think that God would be impassable or unaffected by the world. God's infinite. Um, to be affected by the world is to be separate from it. Perhaps. And to have something outside of you impinge upon you. But if you're infinite, you can't be affected by something outside of your bounds. And then uh, this idea of God as pure act as the, the mover who's not moved, as the effector who's not affected, right? God's not the one who's affected. God does all the affecting. <laughs> you got to ask. I mean, being a bit of a psychologist or a cultural um, you know, analyst, on the one hand, we see in this sort of medieval, analytic, perfect being theology, a movement away from a very gendered God, right? This, I mean, this God, this APB really is an it, not a he. <clears throat> but if you look at which attributes in these, you know, God is God impassable or passable? Is God changeable or not? If you survey, someone from the year 1300 or from the year 2020 who's doing this perfect being theology and you and at the end of 
the survey, you've got a list of all their favorite attributes of God, and you think about that list, you read off that list, you, you might see some kind of gendering of the God there. That is, it might be that really we're smuggling into our idea of perfection some particularly male favorite attributes. That really our model of God is male still. And then when we're asked to think of what the perfect being would be, we're really favoring the attributes that we tend to favor, for good or bad, we tend to favor in men. You know, we want a man. I mean, there's this ideal of masculinity being pure action and not affected. And it's womanly to be affected by the world and to weep by its events. And so when, when you ask someone, well, would God be affected by the world or unaffected by the world if, if our tendency is unaffected? Again, there might be some masculinist assumptions operating there. Of course, it's possible that God is a dude. I mean, <laughs> there's no law that says God must be ungendered. It might be that our universe is created by something which is kind of masculine. Maybe that our universe is created by something which is kind of feminine. Maybe we're in a single mom, a deeply single mom family here. Um, um, but it may also be that this world is the effect of, well, maybe we're in some kind of virtual reality. And, and the fact is the creator God of our world is, a, you know, a super nerd, you know, like a graduate of the MIT in the sky. And he's a dude. So there's no, there's no politically correct rule according to which reality must have at its apex an ungendered God. But, but um, anyway, there probably are just biases which enter into even this very abstract form of um, philosophizing. All right, and here's uh, finally a reason to think reason, to think God is passable personal responsiveness, God would be affected by what's happening to us. Right? We want, uh, if God is loving, God's got to be responsive to our suffering, to care about us. And to care about us is to be affected by what happens to us. So is that, is that, a, is that an imperfection or perfection? If someone, if someone, um, if you feel sad, almost beyond your control because someone you love is sad, does that make you a worse person or a better person? <laughs> Is that a strength or a weakness? Is that a perfection or an imperfection? Well, you can you can see the dilemma here for theists. I mean, masculine uh, assumptions aside, just if you're just if you're just trying to make the best possible being, you might say on the one hand y you want it to be affected by its creatures, responsive, but on the other hand, that does seem to be a kind of limitation. So there's a dilemma here for sure, um, for a perfect being theologist. But uh, again, if uh, a reason to favor the idea that God would be passable is this idea that God should be affected by us. Okay, this is definitely a dude. This is not pure light. This is the masculine facet of the light as it appears to us as we approach it maybe. Um, but under different assumptions, it might appear very maternal or sisterly or might look like a baby, or might look like a bunny, who knows. Is divine omniscience impossible? Is it impossible? What do we mean by impossible? We don't mean just really, really hard to get to. It would take a long time and a lot of degrees to get to omniscience. We don't mean impossible as in practically impossible, meaning it would take you a million years, because God has a million years. God has a million to the power of a million years to study. Um, right. When we ask, is omniscience impossible, we mean a deeper kind of impossibility, what's sometimes called logical impossibility. So the same way that a square circle is impossible, we're asking, is omniscience impossible? Is it incoherent? Well, it might be impossible, um, for God, that is given some of God's other attributes, omniscience becomes problematic. So it might be that omniscience conflicts with incorporeality. Incorporeality means 
lacking a body. And you might say, that's a good thing. God, um, our bodies limit us. Our bodies mean that, mean that we're here and not there. And we can lift X amount of weights, but not X plus 20. God lacking a body gains all sorts of powers, can be everywhere at once, and is not subject to bodily corruption. But lacking a body, God would then not know a lot of things, like what it's like to ride a bike. God would know the total physics of bike riding, could describe, of course, has made, God designed bike riding. God, God is the power that, an intelligence that allows a world in which bike riding happens, but God might be the super nerd who just doesn't know how to ride a bike, like deeply does not know how to ride a bike, meaning cannot do such a thing, lacking a body. Um, there is this, I mean, Jesus, is, is Yahweh incarnating, taking on flesh, coming into the world in order to save the world. <clears throat> That's a very noble reason to enter the world out of love for your creatures. In, in, in the wider uh, human religious tradition, the gods or God often enters the world for much more trivial reasons. Like in the Greek tradition, it seems like Zeus will sometimes incarnate to uh, have a little dalliance with a young maiden. Um, and... Uh, you can imagine God might just one day realizing, you know what, I made, I made bike riding, damn it. And uh, today I'm going to ride a bike. And God might just, in this one, of you know, the, the middle young lady here might be uh, God. Like, okay, here I am riding a bike finally. God just body snatched this girl to feel what it's like to ride a bike for a couple minutes and then went back to heaven. The incorporeal being cannot have experiential knowledge of many things. Experiential knowledge is the knowledge you get on the ground from doing, from being embodied and doing a thing. You can read all about, um, you know, MDMA. Read all about increased empathy and teeth grinding and attraction to dance music and whatever and then and then you do mdma and i'm not advising it as your teacher to do M mdma of course but uh, <clears throat> you, there's a big difference between reading and then and then doing uh, doing and i'm actually speaking from person i'm not advising anything i'm just remembering my own personal experience there's there's a, a period in my late teens and early 20s where i was very fascinated by the psychedelics and but it was all re i just, just read a lot of books about it and and uh, that was very different from actually finally trying, you know, a psychedelic substance. And it's like, oh, okay. In a way, all the reading became not beside the point, but the actual experience is just so different and so, in the end, indescribable. And actually, it's, I mean, psychedelics are just an intensification of, of existence in some way. I mean, everything's kind of weird and everything's impossible to describe. And words actually do a terrible job of describing anything. And the only reason words work is... Uh, they, uh, you have experience of the thing the word's referring to. I mean, the word red would be meaningless to you un until you've experienced red. But once you've experienced red, then I can say the word red to you and you, it calls into your mind a picture of redness or a familiar sensation of some kind and, and uh, you know what I'm talking about. And I think everything's like that. Well, not everything. I mean, we, we do have a, a language of pure abstractions, the kind of thing we do in mathematics. I mean, you need to know what the word two means to do arithmetic, but I don't know if that means you need experience of two-ness. Uh, but there is a large class of knowledge, this experiential knowledge, which is often tied to the body, um, which an incorporeal being could not have. So you got to choose the problem. It's a dilemma again for the perfect being theologian. What do you want? You want your God to be, to have all the freedom and perfection of bodiless existence? Well, the cost of that, there's a cost to everything, right? The cost of that is you're going to have uh, a God who just cannot know certain things. Okay, well, my God will incarnate into the world to know the world. Okay, well, while your God is incarnating, it's subject to the world. And then you've got this Christological problem of, is God omnipotent if God can be executed by the Romans <laughs> and seemingly subject to them? Um, so... 
where were we here? Um, it's a little bit like when you, if you go to Canada Computers or go somewhere on uh, Spadina College and you get a custom laptop put together, um, you know, you're going to have to choose when, you, when you're selecting the specs and uh, you've got, you got your budget. Let's say you're going you're to spend 2000 bucks on a new laptop. Well, and you might think, I'm just going to make the best possible laptop. There will always be a cost to it. So, meaning um, if you want a super fast gaming, gaming laptop, there's going to be a, a, a relative upsurge in the heat generation. And um, you're going to have to get a loud fan put in. Okay, well, uh, to counter the loud fan, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to get some kind of extra heat sink and some kind of under padding, cooling under padding for my laptop to help with the heat generation problem. Okay, your laptop's going to be heavier now. So... I mean, we're familiar with that idea that um, there will be engineering compromises to increase one thing. You're going to have to decrease another thing or add in another thing and therefore, you know, decrease its um, mobility because you're increasing its weight. And it might be that that's true of God too, that anything will have compromises in its engineering. And when, when we're doing perfect being theology, we're doing a kind of mental engineering of the divine being. We're trying to put together this perfect being conceptually. And and we're just seeing here today that there are these costs, or possibly costs. I mean, there, there may be a way of working all this out. God, a little more specific, God cannot have experiential knowledge of lust envy, etc., since he's morally perfect. So this is um, not, not due to incorporeality, but due to moral perfection, God would lack real uh, first-person knowledge of these degraded states of existence. But they're states nonetheless. If you know everything, you know everything. You know what it's like to really want to kill someone, like here. Salieri, at least the Salieri of cinema representation, wants to kill Mozart, the young boy genius with the annoying laugh. Should God know what it's like to be scared? Well, to know what it's like to be scared, you got to be scared. You got, I mean, a great actor. Um, I don't think it's someone who just acts scared, who just manifests the behavioral symptoms of fear. A great actor is someone who manifests those symptoms in a very authentic way by calling on their own. I mean, in method acting, I think you call on your own um, past traumas and you generate in the moment while the cameras are rolling all the symptoms of, of fear because you're, re you're really feeling it. And uh, the, the actor is great. That's a kind of power <laughs> to know those states and to be able to manifest them. And is God, again, this super nerd who can't act and just can't know all these things? And, and then, this, I mean, this is a real problem for theology. In what sense would God have the right to judge us if God doesn't really know what it's like to lust? I mean, you can't... It might be that if God really knew what it's like to lust or to envy, to murder someone out of envy, God would be a lot more forgiving. And maybe God is forgiving. Maybe that's that explains God's forgiveness. God, in the end, knows it's hard, hard to be good. Um, well, this is, again, a real problem. On the one hand, you want God to know everything. And on the other hand, you don't want God to know what lust is like too well. <laughs> Otherwise, God becomes like the Zeus who incarnates into a bull because he's horny. And that just seems very, uh, I mean, to, to modern theistic sensibilities, that at least seems rather undignified, to put it mildly. Um, Aristotle solved this uh, in his mind by saying that knowledge of vile and despicable things would be a defect in God. So Aristotle doesn't seem too concerned here with ironing out all the problems in God's, that, that is in, in making God perfectly knowledgeable. Aristotle's happy to say, sure, there's some things God wouldn't know. 
and it's good he doesn't know those things. And only an imperfect being would quote unquote know these vile states like lust and envy. An omnipotent being who knows they're omnipotent could not feel fear, frustration, and despair. If you know that nothing can hurt you, you can't you can't sensibly fear. To fear is to worry that something bad will happen to you. Anxiety is is the belief, and if we cognitize it, it's the belief that something bad is happening to you or will happen to you, could happen to you. Problem for God. God's the rich kid who doesn't know what it's like to suffer, doesn't have knowledge of the streets. I, Pabali, have a headache today. Or, Pabali has a headache on 26-6-2016. You can insert today's date for that if you want. This is an old slide. Well, for me, the two statements say the same thing. But the perspective is different. The angling is different. The first statement is what's called an indexical claim. An indexical claim or statement is one whose reference can shift from context to context. And, and more commonly, it's, it's, a, it's a sentence with words like now, here, you, he, that, yesterday in them. Words which uh, sort of lock the meaning of the statement to a particular place, time, or speaker, a writer. These are indexical terms when embedded in a statement, make the statements indexical statements. I guess this is a grammatical term or logical term. Okay, fine. What's the big deal? Well, God can know statements of the form two. God can know these, right? But God can never know this. God can never know that I, Paul Bally, have a headache. God can know that Paul Bally has a headache. Okay, uh, is that a big deal? Is, is that just a mm, sort of semantic worry? W would we say, no, God still knows everything, but he knows it from his angle. But doesn't om omniscience take in every angle? If you really know everything, you know everything from every angle. And indexical is a kind of angle. It's a very important kind of angle. It's for us, I think, the, mo the most important angle on reality. I mean, a lot of our knowledge is the effort to maybe climb outside of the indexical a little bit and get objectivity on our situation. I think a lot of science is really the effort to translate this perspective into that. Sure. But again, is, is God then just the ultimate scientist, the super nerd, who knows all the, <laughs> the facts about the world but doesn't know any of them indexically? Uh, partly because, I mean... You can also notice that if you've had a bad headache before, when I say, oh, I, Paul Valley, have a headache, you know that I, Paul Valley, have a headache a little bit through your empathic response to me. You've had headaches before, and you can feel my pain now through memory, memory recall of your own headaches and through the assumption that we're similar enough that our experiences match. So because of your street knowledge of reality, you're having a head that's prone to aches. When I say I have a headache, you feel the resonance of that indexical more than God could. That's the worry here. And our discussion today with this problem from a, a guy named Roland Puchetti. Um, and he's revived, this argument is revived in, <clears throat> in one of your CPR chapters, the Michael Martin chapter. Here's a little skeptical argument. If G is omniscient, then G knows that G is omniscient. Okay. 
knowing everything means knowing everything. If you know everything, you also know that you know everything. So <clears throat> omniscience includes this meta-knowledge of one's own capacity. If G knows that G is omniscient, then G knows proposition Z. What's proposition Z? It's that there are no facts unknown to G. I, G, knows Z. According to Z, there's nothing I, G, don't know. In other words, if you know everything, you know that there's nothing outside of your awareness. You know that your scope, your range of awareness includes everything and there's nothing escaping your purview. Chetty asks, how could anyone ever know Z? <laughs> how could anyone, G or anyone, ever know Z? That is, uh, I mean, this isn't an argument, so put. It, it. We're brought to this sort of worry or this question. How could anyone ever know that there's nothing outside of their awareness? It's like you might know what you know, and you might also, there might be some things you don't know that you know you don't know. So I I know, you know, I've tried, like, like many of us, I've bump my head against the new physics a few times and try to get, get an understanding of what's going on according to 20th century standard model at the subatomic level and just try to, and I just, I just, I just know at this point I just I just know that I really don't know what's going on there I don't I don't I don't understand what it is humans have discovered there really and so that's good that's something I know I know that I don't know that so that's a known unknown right there's the things you know there's the things you know you don't know. Like, quick, what's 3,022 times 5,226? Well, you know right away that you don't know that. You might figure it out on your calculator quickly, but you know that that's something you don't know. But how do you know, how would you know the things you don't know you don't even know? I mean, by their very definition, the things you don't know you don't know things you don't know. You know what I'm saying? This is Pichetti's problem. And the problem is, is, is that, look, this is not just a worry about limited humans. You know, this seems to be something in the very nature of these unknown unknowns that you could, you could never know that you are immune from any unknown unknown. So you're God, or you think you're God. You created the universe, or what you call the universe. You were just humming through what you thought was eternity and bliss, and then you came out of your bliss one day and said, let there be light, and you created the universe, and you ruled over the universe, and then you wrapped it all up in what we on the ground call the apocalypse, and you suck us all back up into your presence, and we hum and dance to the eternal harps in your joyful presence, and never are we interrupted. And you might think, yeah, I'm God. I'm that dude. I created everything, and now I've guaranteed the eternal bliss of everything. Well, it might be that you're just in a little bubble, and there's a much, much wider reality beyond yours. And what you've identified as the total, as the universe, is just a bubble in a multiverse. And you're really just a local God, whom the, whom the, greater, um, the greater chieftains and um, you know, archons have just not bothered with because you're so insignificant or because what you're doing um, actually benefits the larger system somehow, benefits the Roman Empire of the multiverse. And they just let you do your thing and let you have your illusion that you're God. Oh boy, what if I'm that? What if I'm that? So you think you're God and then you have this worry. What if I'm just small potatoes in some larger reality? I just have no ability to access mentally. Well, it might be you really are God. It might be really there is nothing outside of you. The, but Pachetti's point is, how would you know that? How would you know for sure that you're the 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 totality and the and the the absolute? It's it's a question. It's hard to put into a, a articulate kind of logical argument. Um, at some point, we we just hit the mysterium. You know, I th I think. I mean, I think. 
part of, part of what we'll be doing in in this analytic perfect bean theology is just coming to a point where it's hard to see what the answer is. And I think what we're doing there is, in a way, we're conceptually approaching the mysterium. And if philosophy can at least get you to see, get you to that point of helpful confusion about, about God, maybe that's good. That's part of the path of jhana yoga, or approach of God by knowledge. In, 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 in the yoga tradition, you can attain enlightenment just by thinking about God in the right way. I mean, you can also get to God by praying with devotion. You can get to God by doing good works. And you can probably get to God just by doing actual hatha yoga intensely enough. But there's also this path of jhana yoga or knowledge yoga. And APB is a kind of jhana yoga, perhaps. So we, we, we come to this point with through Pachetti's problem. We say, well, on the one hand, It's hard. It's hard to see how God would solve this problem. It's hard to see how um, God. What would be so special about God that God could just know there are no unknown unknowns. On the other hand, we might defer to God's mystery and say, God being so different from us. And knowing so much more than us might just have some way of overcoming this problem of unknown unknowns, which we just can't comprehend. Right? We have to. There has to be a little bit of humility in thinking about the perfect being. At some point, we've got to throw our hands up and say, "Well, it's possible. It's possible that there's something God can do that we just can't comprehend, which overcomes this problem." On the other hand, if it's sort of the mysterium that we're worshiping, out of out of deference to the mysterium, you might side with Pachetti's problem against God. You might say, well, mystery is what's fundamental. At the heart of reality is this mysterium, capital M mysterium. Maybe that's God's true nature. And the fact that the cognitive God, the God who's kind of sitting on his throne of heaven and doing a kind of skeptical philosophy about his own nature, that God is 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 already come down a little bit from the pure mysterium. And when God is wondering on his throne, am I the greatest? Um, that's not the true absolute God. The absolute God is the thing which generates Pachetti's problem. Was that unclear? Maybe it is. We're talking about the mysterium, but I think I, maybe I could have made my point a little, a little better than I than I did. There is still a way to talk somewhat clearly about the mysterium. I, my point is just um, at the heart of existence might be mystery, and Pachetti's problem is just pointing us to that and showing that that even God would not be immune from that. <laughs>